36% of our healthcare dollars on the most expensive 2% of our patients, and we should try to reduce that figure. He goes into some detail in terms of essential benefits and uh, comparing to other uh, systems. The bottom line is he indicates that he would support legislation that addresses this issue by limiting expensive treatments to those that the general public feels create a significant benefit to the patient in terms of longevity and or quality of life. The second uh, bullet uh, from Senator France is we owe Minnesotans some very frank talk about the impact of any health care system changes. And he indicates that Minnesotans can either reduce the number of people who are covered for health care or reduce the list of essential health benefits or reduce reimbursement rates for the essential benefits. He goes on to say it's a mathematical certainty that overall costs will not go down unless one of these three things is accomplished. Up until now, most of what we heard in committee from witnesses and testifiers fails to propose fundamental changes in any of these areas. Senator France indicates, I would support our report pointing out this basic truth so that the public is better able to understand and frame the debate in their own minds. So I'm going to repeat uh, his initial a sentence, Minnesotans can either reduce the number of people covered for health care, reduce the list of essential health care benefits, or reduce reimbursement rates for the essential benefits. Without one of those occurring, it's a mathematical certainty that overall costs will not go down. His third bullet was pharmaceutical costs paid by Minnesota consumers are too high and unfair. He goes on to provide uh, some argumentation uh, supporting that statement, and he concludes by saying, I would support legislation that establishes some form of state review board on pricing. And Senator France's last and fourth bullet uh, recommendation was, health care insurance companies are reaping enormous profits in the U.S. and we lack access to important data. He goes on to say that as the number of insureds has riven, risen with the passage of the ACA and the overall variety of types of medical goods and services provided to patients has grown, profits for healthcare companies have risen dramatically. Yesterday, United Health Group, the parent company for United Healthcare, reported annual revenue for the first time exceeding $200 billion, growth of 9% in just one year. Parenthetically, UHC insures approximately 45 million people nationwide. End of parentheses. These companies benefit from a lack of transparency, which hinders our state's ability to properly evaluate the real cost of providing care. It seems reasonable to require our corporate health care companies to bear additional burdens while we work to provide affordable health care for all Minnesotans. He concludes by saying, I would support legislation that requires an audit of these corporate entities for the public good. He closes by stating, obviously these suggestions tend more toward the economic side of the issues as, depo as opposed to federal versus state, moral, rural versus statewide, rich versus poor. Regardless, thank you, and I look forward to working with the Committee on Recommendations. Any comments? Senator Drahan. Thank you. You know, I, I, my main concern is the pharmaceutical costs, because I think that's something very attainable that we can address. Um, and, I, and I think Nick touches on um, a lot of the same thoughts that I have. And then the other thought that I had um, on pharmaceuticals was to address the opioid issue and the water quality issue and have some kind of uh, group put together to have a collection process for all pharmacies. So if you sell pharmaceuticals, you have a drop box in the pharmaceuticals. Um, area of your clinic or hospital or pharmacy uh, where people can come and drop off all pharmaceuticals, no questions asked, and then they're disposed of. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Drayon. Um, I would try to summarize what you said, but I think you had three or four bullets in there. So would you just repeat those? Uh, just go through the whole, because Andrea's trying to record those. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, so first, the pharmaceutical costs, you know, I, I think should be our top priority. Um, you know, I, I think that affects everybody throughout the state. Um, you know, less federal issues there than some of the other things we're dealing with. Um, and then as far as the collection, um, every pharmacy over maybe 500,000 or a million, whatever the threshold would be, um, that everybody that sells pharmaceuticals to the consumer would have to have a drop box where uh, people would 
have a private place to drop off, no questions asked. And I know there's a lot of them already in place, um, but I think we should work with the industry to do that. So, and I think that would help with the water quality issue and with the opioid. Senator Dram, thank you very much. So basically, the three areas that you identified specifically were costs, the pharmacy drop box, and the opiate crisis. Okay. Um, prior to moving on to any other questions, could I ask other committee members uh, if, there, if they have any specific thoughts regarding uh, the pharmaceutical uh, topics that we've discussed during the course of our eight meetings, uh, rather than shift gears and go to a different area of bending the cost curve downwards, if it's okay with you, why don't we go ahead and stay focused on pharmaceutical topic for now? Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, actually, let me just pause. I do want to address pharmaceutical costs. My um, full thoughts on uh, my recommendations for the committee are available in the record in an email form. And, and uh, number one bullet point is uh, precisely what Senator, Fr uh, Senator Dreheim was addressing. Um, but let me just pause and say, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for uh, convening this committee this summer and fall and winter. Uh, I've commented to you before that I think it's fortuitous uh, that uh, two physicians from opposite parties came to the legislature at the same time. And, and uh, you have certainly made the most of that unusual circumstance. Uh, you've led this committee in a way that has stayed away from sort of partisan uh, bickering and moved towards solutions. It's addressed real issues within cost uh, delivery in, in Minnesota. Uh, and I think uh, had I been in your shoes, I might not have done it quite so well. So thank you. And I also want to thank uh, your leadership and my leadership for allowing this uh, bipartisan committee to do this work to quite a bit of courage and vision. Um, so I wanted to say that uh, initially my, I, it felt like during the hearings we had the most bipartisan interest uh, uh, surrounding the pharmaceutical presentations by Dr. Schonelmeyer. Um, and it's certainly the case that as we've expanded uh, access to health care in Minnesota and in America through the Affordable Care Act, uh, pharmaceutical companies have been largely beneficiaries of that. Uh, and in various uh, taxes, they have contributed to that, but I would argue possibly not sufficiently. Um, it's time that we work towards a more mature relationship with the pharmaceutical industry that recognizes that we do have a moral obligation uh, to ensure access to life-saving medications to all Minnesotans, all Americans, uh, and yet balance that with the very necessary profit motive that drives uh, innovation from pharmaceutical manufacturers. Uh, I would suggest that we move forward with uh, forming some sort of regulatory board with the advice and uh, ideas of Dr. Schonelmeyer uh, that tries to balance those two interests. And, and such a board would uh, would I think defend the interests of respectable pharmaceutical manufacturers by weeding out bad actors um, and uh, we could follow the model that many states have already instituted with regards to pharmaceutical monitoring costs and regulating, regulating costs. So that would be how I would proceed, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Klein. Uh, Senator Wickland. Um, in, in terms of um, pharmacy costs, I, I, I support the suggestions that have been brought forward in terms of investigating further, you know, how we as a state can be um, able to have more oversight or um, a view into uh, pharmacy costs. And I, I appreciate the suggestions that Senator Klein's brought forward and Senator Graham. So I hope that we can investigate those further. So I don't have a, a different suggestion. I think it is it is a high priority that we, we look into. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Um, Senator Klein, uh, I'm going to try to uh, add a few comments on to your comments regarding a regulatory rate commission. I specifically thought that uh, Dr. Schonelmeyer's comments uh, regarding what we could do, and then there was also another pharmacist I think we presented at one of the same days. Uh, my thought was some sort of a regulatory rate um, board that would have the ability to, one, be involved with the initial price setting on a new drug to the market, but then also have involvement with 
some with generic medications in regards to hitting a certain threshold of increase. And I think that whether that's uh, 15 or 20 percent, uh, I think it may have been uh, Vermont or Maine that had a bill that put in place that the Attorney General would play a part of that role in terms of driving data that direction. And I just wanted to ask if, if you would yield uh, to a question. Would that be something that you're comfortable with as well? Uh, yeah, so again, two different proposals. One would be sort of a monitoring and regulatory board that sort of, uh, and, and specifically in your formulation that it would address new pharmaceuticals and generics. Yes, that sounds like a very good way to start for that board. Uh, and then the empowerment of the Attorney General for sort of oversight and prosecution, uh, I think has also, like you said, I think it was uh, Maryland maybe that uh, has gone forward with that and I would also support that. Three, uh, thank, you, thank you, Senator Klein. Three other specific areas that, for, for me, uh, I would like to see us move forward, and I think we should cogitate in regards to whether or not these should be standalone bills. But the, uh, the gag order that's in place from PBMs to local pharmacies, uh, whereby uh, a patient may be actually able to pay cash and pay $10, but if they use their card and pick a copay, they pay 40 uh, My understanding right now is that that kind of information cannot be volunteered by the pharmacy. Uh, I think we probably need some language to disallow that kind of uh, gag uh, order uh, contractual language. Another area would be in the arena of price transparency where we would ask every pharmacy to list their cash prices for perhaps their top 25 prescriptions that they fill. And if we did that, then people could know, um, okay, it, it costs such and such. They still may not be paying that. They may pay a copay or whatever. But if there's a way that we can break through this insulated environment where people have no idea that a medication uh, may cost such and such. I heard a story earlier today uh, from a colleague who indicated that a family member had recently been told that their medication was no longer covered by their insurance. Uh, and so on further inquiry, uh, they were able to learn that the fact of the matter was that the cost of the medication was only 7 or $8. I think if we had more transparency, uh, some of these things would become just better known. How does the cost of seven days of amoxicillin compare to a loaf of bread or uh, a case of beer? Uh, I think we need people to start seeing those prices in order for them to become better consumers. Senator Drahan. I would just like to add, I, I would think you should be for all stock drugs, not just 25. I, I think we need to have transparency on all pharmaceuticals that are stocked in a pharmacy. And if it's something exploratory or experimental, I can see that being a different case. But uh, if they stock it, I think they should have transparency online. So the comment by Senator Dram, thank you, Senator Dram, is that if uh, if they invent, if they have the product in inventory, that there would be a price listed for it. That's going to be a very long list, and I don't disagree with your comment, but that might be something that perhaps they should put on their web page. Uh, but I would like to see us have, in the same way that um, Quick Med Clinics and Target and CVS list their prices for an office visit uh, and a lot of vaccinations, that the pharmacies have them actually posted so that the people that come in to buy a Hallmark card or a box of candy, uh, they would see those somewhere so they could just glance at them. I just think we need that increased exposure. Would you be comfortable with that, Senator Dram? Thank you. I also had a couple other uh, issues on pharmaceuticals, and uh, one was um, the question of uh, the pharmacy benefit managers having their uh, own um, specialty pharmacies and then through uh, contractual language driving specialty prescriptions to their own specialty pharmacy. Um, my understanding is presently there will be times where a PBM may well allow a patient to get their prescription filled locally for once, one or two times, but after that, it's a forced mail order, and the mail order has to go through the through a specialty pharmacy, and sometimes those specialty pharmacies are owned by the very PBM that's governing that. Uh, it, it seems alarming to me that that could even be the case, but I guess it is. And then I think 
the issue of any willing pharmacy has to be brought up as well. Uh, when we fracture that relationship between patients and local pharmacies, uh, we do our patients a disservice. In the same way that I've tried to champion the relationship between uh, medical providers and their patients, I, I would want to champion uh, that relationship between uh, pharmacists and their patients. Um, there's a lot more that goes on than just counting out 90 pills or 180 pills. Uh, there's oftentimes more information provided by the pharmacist to the patient than there is in the doctor's office, that's for sure. Uh, I'm certainly guilty of that myself. And then I also would like to uh, put forward a bill that would disallow physician offices from providing coupons to go with a prescription with the patient to a pharmacy. I think that that's driving the cost up and I think it's a, a very effective marketing tool for pharmaceutical companies to use, but if there's a solid data-driven, scientifically established generic alternative that's not being tried at least once, and the reason that the physician is choosing a specific drug is because there's a coupon that will, for the first year, allow the patient to pay nothing, including having the copay waived. What we're doing is we're sort of allowing that patient and even that physician to be lured into an arrangement that will not be lasting. At some point in time, the rug gets pulled out from underneath, and all of a sudden, the patient or the insurance company or is, is faced with it. And oftentimes, physicians are upset then because they're being asked to do a prior authorization. The fact of the matter is sometimes the prior authorizations that physicians are being asked to, uh, to carry out are based on the fact that they initiated the process. So is there any, uh, any uh, comments in that regard in terms of disallowing f uh, coupons based in physician offices? Okay. Senator Drahan. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, so I just wanted to pause briefly because you uh, have gone through maybe five or six different proposals and they're all, I'm, I'm on board with every one of them. Uh, a highlight of several of them are increasing transparency. You want to publish the list of drug costs, whether it's 25 or all, I'd be on board with either. Um, and then gag orders uh, for PBMs. Uh, now gag orders came up at several points in our hearing and seem to be a part um, of the glue of contracts in um, medical delivery system, whether it's between insurance providers uh, and providers, or uh, in this case, uh, between PBMs and pharmacies. Uh, certainly we want to open up transparency to the best of our ability, uh, and yet I'm sure if Senator Friends was here, our attorney member, uh, he would uh, point out that the countervailing interest is the concern about violating contracts and the primacy of somebody can sign a contract to do whatever they like. So as we move forward with GAGORS, which I think is essential, and, and good work to uh, increase sunlight into medical delivery and costs, uh, I think we should work closely with our more seasoned members of our Judiciary Committee to make sure we do it in a way that uh, is consistent with our uh, respect for contracts. Thank you, Senator Klein. That's an excellent point. And uh, I would agree with you completely. I think that my thought as to how this meeting will translate into the next step would be that we may have a broad topic of pharmaceuticals and underneath that we might have five bullet areas or five areas and then underneath each of those areas there might be two or three bullets and then I think we'll get that out to everybody and we'll also uh, make certain that's available for public consumption as well. At that point in time I would like to think that we're all going to be circling back with our colleagues that have expertise that we don't have and asking okay does this legitimately represent good legislative action for now and are we at that place in that time in terms of the amount of information we need. I think we'll probably have a meeting as a committee in the first part of the session, perhaps in the first week or two of session, uh, where we'll have a, a, a formal draft uh, presentation. And again, that draft will not be legislative language per se. Uh, but I also hope that we're circling back with one another on some of these because um, some of these might well be ready for prime time much quicker than others. And it'd be nice to get those, those possibilities jacketed in, uh, before our colleagues. So your point is well taken. And uh, Andrea, I'm sure will note that. In regards to any other thing I had in terms of pharmacy,
I, the only one I would possibly ask is that um, if we could ask Katie or Dennis, we, we will be discussing yet today the Minnesota Health Records Act. And Katie, can you share with us, does the Minnesota Health Records Act apply to some of these pharmaceutical discussions we're having, or does that only apply to uh, medical charts and, and the sharing of private health information in regards to medical providers? Do you know? Thank you, Katie. Ms. Kavanaugh. Uh, Senator Jensen, uh, in terms of um, disclosing the cost of pharmaceutical, uh, the, are, the, are the drugs that the pharmacies have? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, I was just wondering if the whole question of MHRA being a disconnect with HIPAA, if there's anything that in that conflict that we're gonna be discussing later, if you're, if you're aware, does, does any of that encroach on this issue of pharmacy, medications, things like that? Uh, I don't believe so, as long as you're just uh, disclosing the price and right. not you know, what a patient is receiving or, or that. Um, I think there might be some other issues um, you know, antitrust, you know, you know, Thank that you. sort of thing. But Thank you, Ms. Kavanaugh. And the, the, the um, Health Records Act, no. Thank you much. I appreciate that. And let's move on from price transparency. If we're going to use Senator Frentz's uh, comments, um, is, is bullet number one uh, was relatively generic, but he did suggest limiting expensive treatments to those that the general public feels create a significant benefit. I think that was a more generic comment than it was a specific legislative proposal. Are there any comments from the committee members in regards to that? Seeing none, I'm going to go to his second bullet, which uh, talked about the frank talk about the impact of health system changes. And again, I don't think that that's really uh, a specific proposal for legislation. And then the fourth bullet does specifically relate to potential legislation in regards to uh, audit requirements for corporate entities. Are there any comments from the committee in regards to that bullet item? Senator Wickland. I guess I would just say um, I'd, I'd like to understand better um, what do we already uh, collect and require of these companies to produce and then, you know, have a better understanding of what's already available in terms of data. I, and um, he recommends legislation that would require an audit. And I, I think there's a lot that goes on to um, that we already collect information on. And it just would be helpful if we could kind of categorize what, what is already available from um, the company, insurance companies and and so that we aren't trying to duplicate efforts or ask for something that's already available in a, in a report or um, disclosure. Thank you, Senator Wickland. I think that's excellent. So Andrea, if we could ask uh, you to uh, uh, do some backstory on this so that we know uh, what the requirements are now, how often they're done, who they're reported to, and uh, perhaps uh, you could circle back with Senator Frentz as well and see if he had any specific things he had in mind. Senator Klein. Senator Jensen, so on Senator Friends' second bullet point, um, where I think with a great deal of courage, he sort of pointed out the three very unpopular things that would have to, one of which or a combination of which would have to be addressed to truly bend the cost curve in healthcare delivery. And, and the first was reducing the number of people who are covered. Uh, the second was reducing the list of essential health care benefits. And the third was reducing reimbursement rates for the essential benefits. Uh, and of course, none of those three is a politically popular thing. Uh, any one of them uh, would be very difficult. Um, but I would say one uh, idea that occurred to me that came up in our committee was addressing more vigorously uh, low value care. And we did hear a presentation um, on sort of excessive lab test ordering and so forth. Um, which was good, but I felt addressed most of sort of low cost areas of healthcare delivery. So one of my suggestions would be that we charge the Department of Health with investigating um, the use and cost across Minnesota of some of the more high cost driving uh, procedures, which could arguably be uh, considered at times unnecessary or excessive, specifically elective joint replacement. Uh, as we've discussed, um, and surgeries of that regard. So uh, I would uh, offer that as a suggestion. Thank you, Senator Klein. 
uh, while you're speaking, I was kicking around how would we best accomplish that, and I had a couple of ideas. Senator Wickland, did you have an idea? I guess I'd add on to that. I think we need to do more to explore, um, maybe to understand and study where the the variations are and the um, where the costs are high, and um, in terms of the low value services, and maybe some of those those also those higher. Uh, more expensive services, and, and we had some presentations by the Department of Health uh, about cost variation, and we could probably explore, and low value services, and I think more work to understand more of those, um, either the uh, high frequency or high cost procedures. Um, I think that would be something that would be good to ask of the department to, to maybe produce more studies on that. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. One, it, it's difficult to define uh, a low-value service. Uh, one person's low-value service might be another person's life-saving event. Um, if, you, if you do uh, a thousand unnecessary CAT scans and one out of a thousand finds something that does indeed have a beneficial effect for someone's health, for that one individual, uh, that was a lifesaver. I do think that even though that kind of statistical anomaly does occur, uh, we still need to do something to try to reduce the low-value services. And one thing that jumps out at me is uh, actually some of the headlines in the paper this morning uh, in regards to uh, President Trump's health. Um, there was an interesting uh, back and forth dialogue between two cardiologists uh, who uh, were really not uh, invited into uh, an analysis of his health since they didn't have the chance to examine him. Uh, but they actually did get into uh, what many people think is a low value service in regards to uh, calcium scoring uh, for, for the heart. And so one of the cardiologists makes a comment, uh, well, obviously President Trump can't be in terrific cardiovascular health because his calcium score is such and such. And uh, the other cardiologist has already said that President Trump is not in good health. He said, well, he's not in good health, but that's not the reason because his calcium score is meaningless unless it's over 700. And just yesterday, the United States Preventive Services Task Force came out and said that there's no evidence that calcium scoring is valuable or beneficial. So it was interesting to me that within the same 24 hours, we had the one of the highly regarded um, medical groups, scientific-based, uh, USPSTF, coming out and saying there's really no value that we can identify. And then the next day we have in the paper uh, two cardiologists who decide to stick their nose in uh, someone's um, health analysis uh, and then quibbling about it. So we might want to think about passing a piece of legislation that would call for the Department of Health to analyze uh, those conflicts between USPSTF recommendations and physician ordering patterns. And it wouldn't necessarily be that physician ordering patterns are inappropriate, but it might be that if you find that there's only two organizations in the entire state ordering calcium scoring that are leading us to go down a bunch of rabbit holes we don't want to go down, because that's what happens. It's, it's not just the low value service, it's the downstream testing. And I think, uh, quite honestly, I've had I've been quite impressed with the kind of uh, data that the uh, Department of Health has provided this committee during the course of the testimony. Um, I, um, I, would, I would love to query the Department of Health and might even specifically call out to uh, see if uh, Stefan Gildemeister uh, would be interested in looking into something like that. Uh, late The last few days, he and I have been going back and forth because I've been asking him, who are these 200,000 people, these Minnesotans that are uninsured? Because if you look at our, our MA and you look at our MinCare, you would think that from zero to 200% of the federal poverty line, there wouldn't be many of the 200,000 in that group. And then because we have advanced premium tax credits from 200 to 400, you might think that those also, those people also probably wouldn't be where they are. So you might think that of the 200,000 Minnesotans that aren't presently covered, that the majority would be somewhere around that 400% federal poverty line. But in fact, astonishingly enough, more than 50% of the people that are not insured are indeed in, uh, eligible for MA or MinCare or APTC. So I, I really think that we need to look at a resource like the MDH to help us clarify how do we best go after the low value services, not necessarily with a club, but sometimes just with information. 
So I think that um, if the uh, Department of Health uh, representatives that are in the audience today uh, would be so kind as to kick that around and to perhaps help us formulate um, a policy uh, legislative piece that might be warmly received bar bipartisan by House and Senate, that we could get moving on that so that we could try to uh, uh, do a more robust job of identifying low value services and perhaps doing nothing more than publishing the data. Because quite frankly, in the world of being a physician, nobody likes to be called out as an outlier especially if it's going to be identified as a potential low value service. And that doesn't necessarily change physician behavior, but it gives us pause to reevaluate, which may be all that we need to ask for right now. Any other comments in that regard? So I guess we could say that I have asked the Department of Health officials here today the, to complete their homework assignment and get back to our CLA, Andrea. And thank you all those folks out in the audience. Uh, moving on, uh, in terms of uh, any other questions on the bullet number two? Senator Wickland. I, I was just going to say I had I had written down that after we have more information, you know, in terms of reducing the use of low value services, that you know it probably will require some joint legislative provider and consumer discussions about you know how to use or how to better encourage use of um, maybe guidelines like the choosing wisely, choosing wisely guidelines. Other things like that. I mean, it gets back to what you're saying that you know if we have the information, then um, maybe we can make use of it in consultation with you know providers and consumers to find out the best way to to influence behavior. Thank you, Senator Wickland. I think you're absolutely right, and I think we do have resources available. I think the all-payer claims data is quite a good tool, and I think if we combine that with the experiences of some of our, our major uh, health carriers uh, in Minnesota, I think they'll be able to help us uh, put a bright light on some of these things as well. And, and I actually, I, I believe that um, many of our hospitals uh, would be interested in participating in that process of identifying uh, what can we do differently? Sometimes uh, these tests are ordered not necessarily because anybody expects any meaningful information to come from them, but because that is the standard of care. And sometimes things are driven by algorithms. And I, I, that does get into that whole issue of is there a need for um, uh, attention being given to uh, tort reform? But moving on, uh, I think we've sort of covered Senator Frentz's input. and. Uh, I think I'm going to turn to Senator Klein uh, to see if he would like to put a couple other marks out on the table that we could start discussing. Senator Klein, would you yield to this? Mr. Chair, yes. So Thank you. Uh, most of my ideas, uh, again, they're in the record and, and we've addressed them through our um, discussion already. One thing, we did hear great testimony this uh, year from Hennepin Health and other organizations who have tried to sort of change the incentive uh, drivers in medical delivery, um, focusing less on a pay-by-procedure type mentality and more on a global care and how do we make sure somebody uh, is in safe housing and has their mental health needs met and has transportation and so forth. And those obviously end up uh, contributing tremendously just both to poor health and to up rising costs as I see, uh, of course, at my shifts at Hennepin County Medical Center. People come in, emergency department, because sort of a failure of one of those uh, fundamental life functions has, has occurred. And if we can focus more on ensuring global health rather than uh, billing the next CAT scan or billing the next admission, uh, we'll move towards something better. And I know previous legislative sessions have tried to take this issue on with uh, vigor and I commend their courage. Um, uh, it's going to be a difficult thing to change within the culture of medical delivery. Uh, it's, it's going to actually have to change the way physicians like me and, and every, every level of provider thinks about how to care for people. Uh, but I just offer it as a, a thought at this committee that as uh, in future sessions we see uh, proposals come forward, we should be eager to embrace uh, pilot projects and other incentives. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Wickland. Uh, yes, I, I had... Uh, kind of made note, I'd gone through and kind of highlighted areas that I thought we should investigate further. And, and what I had come up with kind of two different topics, um, how can we better include consideration of the social determinants of health in care systems, which is kind of globally saying what um, Senator Klein is saying about um, how do we make more consideration of um, things like housing, transportation, access to, to healthy foods, um, things like that, because 
what we understand now is that can have a great impact on people's health and if we can prevent um, and address health concerns upstream, you know, we're, we're likely to have some impact on costs, future costs. Um, and then also, uh, can we replicate use of successful models more quickly or accelerate expansion of successful models? Uh, we heard from Hennepin Health, as he mentioned, and also um, Southern Prairie Community Care about some successful efforts that they have in terms of engaging their community and engaging different types of health workers to um, maybe more successfully address um, patient needs, upstream needs, um, in a way that, um, you know, it isn't necessarily a doctor, but a community health worker that can do that. Um, so that would be definitely an area that I, I think we should try and investigate ways that the legislature can either encourage policy development or um, uh, ways to use funding streams in different manners to, to kind of optimally address these upstream needs. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Other comments? I would comment on that. I, I think you're right. I, I met this morning with uh, several different uh, groups and one of the things I was struck by was that team base that's more horizontally aligned where if you have someone that's uh, disabled uh, or challenged and these folks are back and forth in the hospital seven, eight times a year, uh, oftentimes uh, their needs are not attended to until there's a certain level of desperation that requires emergency medical transportation and things like that. Uh, I have to say that I, I do worry about the vertical integration that sometimes comes with uh, uh, the integrated health partnerships because sometimes it just distances, I think, the patient uh, from uh, perhaps a level that they need to be involved with. And so I, I just think of my own clinic, and I know that uh, we have uh, many beloved patients that when we reach out and make a couple of phone calls a week to see how they're doing, uh, when we can make certain that their transportation needs are met so they're able to get to our office or if the weather is inclement, yeah, we're calling them. Excuse me. <clears throat> We're calling them and saying, let's uh, move the visit or we'll have a nurse stop over or, or I'll stop over at the end of my day. The whole thing goes a lot better. So there's, we somehow need to figure out a way. I, I did meet with you care folks today and, and they're interested in moving in that direction and trying to figure out, you know, how can we, how can we take that high risk, high expense group and get them the kind of care that would really reduce the dollars that we're spending because these people that spend over $100,000 a year, they're not asking to do that. This isn't necessarily meeting their needs at all. It may meet the needs of the system or all the various players in the system, but the fact of the matter, it may be the last thing they want. And I think that from personal uh, experience, I think I could say that pretty comfortably, that there are many folks that would like to not have all these services or trips to the hospital. So I, I think we should do that. Uh, you also mentioned, uh, Senator Klein, uh, or at least uh, referenced the whole concept of different payment mechanisms. And I think the concept of bundling has to be explored at greater level. I, I know that um, I think Blue Cross right now is, is working uh, with uh, uh, some neodontologists, OBGYN, in terms of trying to uh, see if uh, we can bundle the, instead of just the prenatal package and uh, the delivery on the part of the physician, but bundle the prenatal package, uh, the physician costs, uh, the delivery center, uh, the postpartum care, and the care for the mom and the child uh, for the month following. And uh, I know that uh, Dr. Steve Calvin is doing some of this. He's, I think he's building another birthing center over in Minneapolis. He has one not too far here from the Capitol. And uh, I know that when it comes to uh, dollars being paid and things like that, there could be tremendous savings if we were to move in that model. I also know that there are some centers that are putting together a package deal for total joint replacements and the cost might be in the low 20,000, uh, while if you don't do it that way, oftentimes the uh, cost is in the 50s. At bowling last night, I had a fellow who just had his knee replaced, a 55-year-old farmer, and he came up to me and told me that he had it done at a same-day surgery center and then they just, and across the hallway, they had a uh, sort of a, overnight stay kind of place that he was, avail he was able to stay in. And his total costs were about 23000 but if he would have gone with the standard hospital setting, it would have been 46000 
So there's no, there's no question we've got to be innovative, and I think it's pretty difficult to ask a patient try to track uh, how many boxes of Kleenex they used while they're in the hospital for $30 a box or how many Tylenol tablets they got that they paid $15 for a nickel tablet. And so I think the concept of bundling and doing the packages are, and, and tying those to value uh, ratings um, is probably where we have to go. Uh, other items that you might like to move on to in terms of general topic areas? I'll throw one out while you're catching your breath. Um, any willing provider, I think that in terms of insulating patients from the cost of health care, I think we're guilty of asking people to go to the grocery store, shop for their food for the next 30 days, and getting a bill two months later and, and having them uh, experience sticker shock. We need somehow to change the way we societally provide health care services. People need to have an idea of what it costs. So I would like to put forth legislation that indicates the top 25 procedures that a medical clinics and medical facilities perform with perhaps the top 10 uh, preventive services that they provide. Those should be on the web page and they should also be available at the clinic. Uh, right now, there's hesitation on the part of clinics, hospitals, and a variety of other kinds of facilities to do this because there's language in contracts with insurance carriers that disallow sharing of information. And yet on the other hand, if you explore the statutes in Minnesota right now, there is language that calls forth patients being able to receive good faith estimates. So if you actually look at all the language, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. I think we should put together courageous legislation that disallows gag ordered uh, clauses from insurance companies not allowing uh, clinics and facilities to share with their patients. I would like to see my clinic post our retail price for a service, the Medicare price, the medical assistance price, and the price of the commercial carrier that we use the most. And that, that carrier wouldn't have to necessarily be identified. It could just be, this is the commercial carrier price that we use more than anyone else, or that we, ch that we have the, that, the greatest number of services. And I think anything short of that, we're really not serious about trying to get that kind of information in the public's hands, and I think they deserve it. Thoughts or comments? Senator Klein. So actually creating a public database of uh, pricing at various uh, providers around Minnesota, is that right? Senator Klein, yes, a public database, but, uh, and I think we could actually put it, if, as far as I'm concerned, we could do it on a centralized database with the Department of Health. But I, I think that we should require any clinic to do it as well on their own. They wouldn't have to put their, uh, the clinic that they compete with down the road on. They just need to post theirs, those four prices, Medicare, medical assistance, uh, your top commercial carrier, and then uh, your retail price. And just for the public's uh, uh, knowledge, uh, it, generally, most clinics, if you charge $200 and that's your retail price, um, you're generally going to get from your commercial carrier somewhere around 140 or 150 and you'll get from Medicare, you're generally going to get about half, uh, maybe $100 on a $200 retail charge, and then a medical assistance, you're going to get somewhere around 30%, so you end up getting about $60. That's just general numbers. But I would like to see the responsibility put on both. I think we should make every effort we can to get the public this information. Senator Wicklund. Uh, I certainly think that having more public access to information is good and costs. I would like to see if we have that discussion. I think we need to have input and um, more background on, on what the impact will be on um, kind of our, our markets and what's a, what products are available for customers in terms of um, health plans. Um, because, I, I mean, there's, there's history as to how we got to where we are today, and I guess I just want to make sure we understand if we're setting something in motion or we're going to put something in place that um, requires, um, I don't know, display of prices. I mean, it sounds very transparent, but I guess I'd like to understand, you know, what, what's going to happen or what would happen if we choose to do that? What's the impact on consumers in the end? So. Thank you, Senator Wickland. I think your words are wise. It's, I think it's always good to make certain as we move forward that we're trying to anticipate what kinds of unintended consequences could come forth. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, another um, this, this has not been discussed in a very robust fashion, but it, it was mentioned a couple of times, and I would like to ask the committee's comments on the concept of a DPC, or direct primary care. 
Uh, direct primary care is a bill that is moving forward at the federal level. Uh, I believe Congressman Paulson is carrying that bill at the federal level. And we did have some references to it, but and we did at one time have a testifier scheduled, but uh, I don't know if that was a canceled meeting or a, uh, a postponed meeting. But regardless, a direct primary care, what the bill would, if I put this forward, what it would look for is that it would reclassify. So if someone wanted to go see Dr. A for their ongoing care for a year, um, for all the care that they might require at a clinic, a physical exam, sinus infection, sprained ankle, uh, hemoglobin check, and maybe a couple of INRs to determine where your blood level anticoagulation is, that they could pay that amount. And what the bill is trying to do is to allow patients to use their HSAs to do that and to also classify that as a medical payment and not as an insurance payment. And that way, these direct primary clinics that choose to do this would not be regulated by the insurance company, but they would be uh, regulated uh, by whatever branches address medical cares, because that's one of the big stopping points for a direct primary care, is that because it's treated as an insurance company, uh, that's an, it's treated as an insurance plan, uh, that gets in the way. So that's, that's one of the key things that uh, uh, Congressman Eric Paulson's trying to get through. And I, I did want to mention that to the committee that uh, despite the fact that that hasn't been something that we've uh, really gone deep into the weeds, uh, I do intend to uh, uh, move forward on that if I can. So I'm sort of an open a full disclosure kind of thing. Uh, another area that um, I think we need to talk about is, and again, we had some, some peripheral comments, but right now in terms of uh, the Health Insurance uh, Portability Act um, and the Portability and Accountability Act, um, HIPAA, has a certain threshold for uh, PHI or uh, private health information. Um, the, the standards we have in Minnesota actually exceed the federal HIPAA. That does get in the way for uh, a lot of uh, both uh, hospitals, providers, but also patients. And uh, I've been approached and asked if there would be a, uh, an appetite to move forward on this. Oftentimes what ends up happening is patients end up having to give uh, a release form signed over and over and over again. And there's no question it does uh, cause duplic duplication of testing. <coughs> Uh, we had a situation just the other day where we had a patient who broke her arm and on the CAT scan they had to do on the humerus to determine whether or not uh, they were going to have to take her surgery. They identified on the very outskirts of the CAT scan uh, pulmonary nodule. And so the radiologist very alertly identified the pulmonary nodules and suggested that the patient have repeat CAT scans at 3, 6, and 12 months to make sure those nodules weren't growing. And that's not an uncommon thing. Um, we didn't get at our clinic that CAT scan because we weren't the treating physician for the humeral fracture. So when the patient very alertly contacted us and said, do I need to do this whole thing all over again? Uh, our comment was, what are you referring to? And she said, well, remember three years ago we did all this then. So we went to her chart, and she indeed had had those pulmonary nodules identified previously and had already had the CAT scans done at uh, 0, 3, 6, and 12 months. Uh, had that data come to us right away, it would have helped us identify that. And even the process of having the radiologist take the CAT scan of the humerus, which showed the pulmonary nodule, we called over and had them specifically compare the previous CAT scans that were done of the chest three years ago. And indeed, those nodules were stable and represent nothing. But that would have been a low value services. And in part, it would have been aggravated by the fact that the um, standards that we hold uh, the transfer of uh, private health information in Minnesota uh, may well be getting in the way. So I think that we should be looking at that issue as well. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, so I uh, first of all want to say that the, the changes in our philosophies in medical delivery surrounding privacy that came with HIPAA uh, have been extremely valuable and absolutely necessary. It's fortunate that they occurred in conjunction with um, sort of the electronic medical record dissemination. And, and so this culture has built up around medical delivery that 
you know, when somebody asks for information on your patient, you have to make sure that that patient is consented and so forth. Uh, and before you find another chart, you have to make sure the patient agrees to allow you to do that. And those federal standards are absolutely necessary, and I will defend the, the privacy standards that they have set uh, down the road. Uh, having said that, Minnesota has instituted a standard that's excessive and high above that and contributes to poor care delivery and higher costs in just the way you describe. When you are not able to access a patient's medical record in an emergent situation, you end up reordering tests that have already been done. You end up treating things that have already been addressed. Uh, and I, I do see it in uh, medical delivery every day as I practice. Uh, scaling back and balancing our concerns for privacy with concerns for cost-effective care uh, to the federal standard rather than the Minnesota state standard would be a very prudent step uh, for this committee to take. Senator Klein, thank you. Senator Wickland. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to see further discussion of that, of this concept. Um, I carried a bill a couple years ago, and we, we did move it through, um, partway through the process um, in the Senate uh, to address some of these concerns. And um, I think we've done a lot. Um, that year, we were able to um, get through a couple committees. Uh, we didn't make it all the way through the process. But I'd be happy to see more work done on that. Um, in the meantime, or since then, um, the Department of Health did do a request for input from uh, public providers and, and plans and systems um, in terms of what benefits they would see from um, modernization of our, our um, Records Act. And so we have, we have information collected. We have had people looking into this. And I think um, nation, across the nation, I think people have been looking at this as well. And so we do have some other resources we could draw on to, to try and do, um, do this in a way that, that preserves, absolutely preserves privacy and um, preserves security for patients. Um, so they know that um, they can have confidence in their, their providers and their, their health system. Um, but also uh, allows us to address the um, higher costs or um, impediments to care that we see with current, the current system. So I'd be happy to, to work on that with you. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Uh, in fact, uh, my understanding is the Minnesota Health Records Act actually uh, antedated or predated uh, the uh, HIPAA, and that's in part why our standards are actually exceeding the HIPAA. And so the HIPAA standards have, uh, I think we're one of 12 states that actually has standards that are above that. And I actually have uh, the bill that you introduced, Senator Wickland, in 2016. And then I think a similar bill was introduced in 2013. And uh, if, uh, if that were something that you were interested in authoring, again, I certainly would uh, uh, like to work with you as a co-author and, and help uh, push your bill forward. Um, so uh, anyway, thank you for that. Um, anything else uh, that the uh, committee would like to uh, comment on? Senator Thanks. Wicklund. Um, just a couple other areas that we, um, I think that we should somehow um, have a discussion about either, you know, in some recommendations um, or just, or today, just in terms of one of the areas that stood out for me was the um, aspect of, um, and actually Senator Klein mentioned it, mentioned it, um, the, the amount of um, money that's going, or actually Senator Friends, I think, uh, mentioned the amount of our um, health care costs going towards chronic disease, um, um, addressing chronic diseases. Um, so I would say, you know, if there's any way we can look at, you know, are there prevention activities that we could be um, enhancing or um, improving on um, in terms of legislative action or um, are, is there more information that we need before we can decide on what best course of action is? Uh, Department of Health did do a very extensive report on um, chronic disease costs and so maybe from that uh, maybe there's further detail or further information that we need <clears throat> excuse me to <clears throat> to make recommendations about what to do next but um, I'd like to see some discussion about that thank you Senator Wicklund mm -hmm. yeah just to, to <laughs> piggyback on your comment there I know that with the direct primary care um, approach uh, if you just 
allow me just to, like once again, reference my own office. I know that I have many patients with multiple chronic uh, illnesses, and, and this may sound crass, but I, 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 I say these words simply in an effort to be blunt and honest and cut to the chase, but in the present situation, we're not paid if we're not seeing the patient. But if we had a bundled payment that, that um, a carrier uh, or the, the Department of Health came and said, we'd like you to take care of this patient's uh, outpatient needs, uh, we'll pay you. Uh, this patient's been spending approximately $8,000 a year in the clinic. Uh, we'll pay you $1,500 um, to provide the, the care, whether they're seen or not. And so it's a little bit of the old HMO model. Uh, so, But in the HMO model that we used to work under, and I might even say suffer under, uh, there was a risk to providers, and we had to pay for the hospitalizations and the CAT scans and things like that for patients, and that was just too much. So oftentimes you'd have physicians and physician groups getting in financial trouble because they were having to take out of their allocated dollars the necessary dollars to pay the hospital or whoever for the MRI or the CAT scan. And so we need to think about this more, I, I think, in trying to keep things local and in that team approach that, that, that we mentioned, because I think what we've done in the past hasn't worked as well as we had hoped. And so I think um, we need to try something else, because if all we're going to do is what we've done, we're not going to get much different. Um, I, I thank you for that. I would like to see us um, pass a simple piece of legislation that says that um, when a patient goes to a same-day surgery or any kind of facility, an emergency room, that they're advised uh, at the very front end uh, before any costs are incurred that that facility does charge a facility fee, and it's a significant facility fee. Because I think oftentimes patients are under the impression that it's their complaint that determines whether or not there's a facility fee. Well, gee, doc, it was only a sinus infection or it's just a sprained ankle. And I would have been willing to pay that if I would have broken my ankle, but since I didn't, why am I paying $150 for the ER doc, but $1,000 for the facility fee? And so I, I think, again, in that interest of transparency, I think we need to tell people, you know, you will be getting a facility fee if you receive medical services in this facility. Uh, I've got just a couple more that I, oh, I also think that we should be looking at any willing provider within a network should be uh, allowed if they're, if, if these, uh, in regards to primary care. Uh, I think the primary care relationship between the patient and the physician is very important. It's oftentimes the relationship that helps keep a patient away from an unnecessary intervention, potentially putting them at risk or potentially just being a very low value service. And so I think in an effort to preserve that relationship, if, if a primary care is uh, a member of a plan's networks in some areas, but not in other areas, and that primary care physician indicates that he or she will abide by the referral pattern, accept the same fee schedule, and comply in all ways with that network uh, that, that, chose, that network has already chosen for their in-network providers, I think they should be allowed in. And I, I think that that's a huge issue. Uh, Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, so two things. Uh, first of all, on the direct primary care, which you brought up a couple times now, uh, it sounds interesting. I, uh, we did, as you say, miss testimony on it this year. And so as your bill, which I suspect you'll draft in uh, advance, goes forward, it would be helpful to have a committee hearing on it. Perhaps not in this committee, which is going to dissolve, but maybe in one of the health committees. <coughs> Um, and then with regards to your initiatives on any willing provider, uh, and again, the charge of this committee is to address health care costs, and this certainly sounds as though it's going to improve health care access uh, and is laudable in that regard. Um, do you have a sense or can you answer what it might have as an impact on health care costs in Minnesota? Thank you, Senator Klein. I, I remember specifically when uh, Senator Gazelka and I discussed this committee, um, he did not want it to be simply affordability, and that's why it's access and affordability. He wanted us to spend some time on access, and I think the reason he wanted that was uh, there is so much evidence that if we're able to allow a patient access to a primary care provider that they have trust in, that that will reduce the amount of things done. If, if, if a physician says to a patient, well, and I say it all the time, uh, I'll be sitting with a patient, I'll say, you know, I don't think you really want to do that. You know, a joint replacement is not likely going to take care of your problems. You know, it's you know, the, the two packs of cigarettes and the extra two 
250 pounds is probably more the issue. You know, when I say that kind of thing, you know, you know, I, and I've got a relationship with my patients where I can say that, and they're not offended or insulted. And they say, well, Doc, you know, you've served me well for the last 25 years. You know, I appreciate you saying that. And we sort of drop it. We don't do the MRI. We don't do the specialty referral. And the patient doesn't get a knee replacement. I know there's no question uh, that if that patient were seeing a provider that they hadn't seen before, there may well be. Well, you know, if you want a knee replacement, well, have you seen orthopod? And you go to the orthopod, the MRI gets done, MRI looks bad, bone on bone, you go get the surgery. And then those are the people that have the deep vein thrombus and have a miserable you know, uh, event, and uh, their convalescence is uh, incredibly difficult. So, yeah, I do think that there would be a, a significant bending of the cost curve by maintaining that relationship, albeit dif difficult to measure, difficult to measure. And then uh, I think um, the last thing that... Um, I, I think that in line with the whole network question is I think we need to look at whether or not we're uh, really uh, doing our best to hold prices down uh, by having such tremendous disparity of fees across the board. I think it's difficult for the insurance carriers uh, to negotiate with the systems. I think the systems uh, sometimes have the insurers by a stranglehold. I think sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, but I do think that... Uh, when one system is getting $100 for a service and another system is getting $50 for a service uh, for the same exact service, I think that uh, this poses problems and is going to create problems. And I, and I think that that also is, uh, is, is, is part of the, the, the problem here. So that's all I have to say. Uh, Senator Wicklund, did you have anything else? I guess just, just a couple other topics that I had written down. Um, in terms of access, because I, I was thinking about the access as well. Um, you mentioned primary care. I think strengthening primary care is something that we should keep in mind. I think we've had um, commissions and groups that have looked at our health care workforce, and certainly um, having enough primary care providers is one of those areas that we identified as you know, being a need, especially in greater Minnesota. So um, I think that's still a concern is um, do we have enough primary care providers? Do we have um, networks that people can access um, primary care? Because I, I do agree with you that I think having a good um, relationship with a primary care provider, what I read in literature is that that, that does have an impact on um, health. It's harder to measure, like you say, but I think um, it can do a lot to, um, as you say, prevent um, using services that they don't actually need, or it can also prevent um, people from um, progressing to chronic diseases that you know we we know are more expensive to to treat. Um, so that would be an area. And then another in terms of access that I personally would like to look at and is network network adequacy and kind of how our state is working um, to determine um, review of the, or reviewing the um, proposals that come from plans and how do we determine adequate networks. So that's an area that I, I'm planning to investigate myself, so. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I have, I have nothing else. Andrew, do you have anything? I think that uh, uh, the, our number has dwindled a bit. And uh, we will plan on having another meeting uh, probably after February 20th. And uh, I think that between now and then, uh, Andrea will be corresponding with the committee, uh, getting some summary documents out. And then I would think that we'd probably take an action uh, in February on uh, some sort of a white paper summary uh, that everybody, I, I would love to see a nine to nothing vote on that, that everybody's comfortable that these are initiatives that we think uh, deserve our attention sooner rather than later. And I hope that we can help convince our, our colleagues uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, that we need to probably do something a little bit more than just nibble on the edges and that uh, maybe something a bit more transformative uh, is necessary considering how critical health care is and how much time we spend on, on the topic of it. So having said that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.